When I bought this Matfeil Bojia carbon steel pan, it came with some unconventional seasoning instructions. You wash off all the wax that came with it during shipping and then fry the skins of two potatoes in oil and a palmful of salt. I tend to chalk this up as some sort of archaic French routine meant to manufacture a sense of old world mystique, but whether or not it works, you should definitely still cook with a pan over and over again in order to build and strengthen that seasoning into something that lasts. So with all these peeled potatoes lying around, I've been making rosti. Here's the process. Take a few peeled potatoes and break them down into long, narrow strands. The number of potatoes will depend on the size of your pan and your desired rusty thickness. I'm doing three medium taters for an eight inch pan. You could just grate them on a box grater, but I would suggest instead opting for a food processor or a mandolin with the julienne attachment mentioned in my previous video. The long strands of a julienne potato weave together in a way that chippy grated hash brown shreds do not, making the dish a little easier to flip and a little more striking in appearance. As soon as you've got a big pile, use a towel to pat them all dry. Move quickly so the potatoes do not oxidize and turn brown first. Wet potatoes will take longer to cook and won't become as crisp, so this step is important. Once patted dry, season everything with at least salt plus anything else that goes with potato. This pan has been preheating with oil in it over medium high heat. You can use non-stick or cast iron as well, but use a pan with sloped sides to make flipping easier. The amount of oil you use will depend on your pan's size. This eight incher needs say three tablespoons of oil in it, but a 10 inch pan might need twice as much. Use vegetable oil, ghee, duck fat, anything that you would use to roast potatoes in a hot oven. Nestle in the dried and seasoned potatoes and gently press them into an even layer. There's a little bit of finesse that comes into play here since the edges will cook faster than the middle. Flatten it all out and then push the rim in all the way around to make a neatly shaped edge that's no thinner than the center, which will cook more slowly. Now you wait. This can take 15 to 20 minutes depending on how much moisture the pan has to drive out from the potatoes. I like to check in on the progress every couple of minutes, lift up a small portion and check on the color. I also rotate the pan every time I take a peek in an effort to offset any potential hot spots. You might need to add more fat as it cooks. You want there to be enough to partially submerge the potatoes, but not so much that you're deep frying the whole thing. If the fat gets too depleted, the heat won't transfer evenly and you'll get little tips of burnt potato instead of evenly brown strands. This is what people tend to get wrong regarding how much fat restaurants use. It's not just a cheat code for tasty food, it's also a matter of proper heat distribution. Anyway, the downside of adding too much oil is that when it comes flipping time, you stand the risk of splashing hot fat everywhere and burning the flesh off your forearms. Be careful. After 12 minutes, this is ready to flip. I can tell by the way it slides around in one piece and how peeking under each edge reveals a dark brown color. To flip, you may use a spatula that's appropriate for whatever size roasty you're making, and this part does get significantly more difficult with an increase in pan diameter, so start small on your first one. You could also use the old two plate method if you aren't entirely confident flipping directly in the pan. I'm gonna flip without a spatula today, and if it breaks apart, just mash everything back into place and hope for the potato starches to bind the pieces back together. From here, cook the other side on the stove for a few minutes until it is equally as crispy. Once the roasty is golden brown on both sides, slide it onto a wire rack to to drain the excess oil. You could use paper towels, but I prefer the extra airflow that a rack lends to the process. There's one last optional step I'll note for the extra crispy crunch lovers. This is going into a 400 degree smoker. This step is a little extra, but the dry heat and airflow will make the outside significantly crispier, plus the wood pellets will impart a tiny amount of bonus smoke flavor. It's 109 degrees outside today, so there's no way I'm gonna turn on my oven indoors. If you don't have a grill, just pretend that I'm cooking it inside of a 400 degree oven right now, or just skip this step entirely. The final dish should be like one massive hash brown that's smuggling creamy mashed potatoes underneath its shell. To serve, cut it into triangles, pizza style, and garnish with sour cream and chives, or with a big green apple slaw, or with smoked salmon, poached eggs, and avocado. Just about any brunch dish could be adapted to use a piece of rosti as the base, and honestly, to see a power bottom be this flexible, how could you not stand? Who writes these? Morning Brew has paid to be mentioned at the end of this video. Morning Brew is a media company that specializes in daily email newsletters. After you sign up, you'll get one email every day of the week containing that day's business news. 
Each one takes about five minutes to read and they aim to both inform and entertain. I read today's Morning Brew and learned that 99% of Fortune 500 companies and 75% of the US employers surveyed use an automated scanner to filter job applicants. Do you think that people like me who widely disregard best practices in appealing to algorithms might be getting shut out by something like that? Hmm. If you're interested in business, finance, or tech, click the link in the description to subscribe to Morning Brew today. It's free and it takes fewer than 15 seconds to subscribe.